with Bobby Fischer, it was the accumulation of small advantages step by step over the course of the game at, that at the end would lead to an overwhelming force. It's really a work of art to watch him play, to see how he would do little things and then move after move, it would become overwhelming for his opponent. This game was played at Mar del Plata. His opponent is Grandmaster Pilnick. This was played in 1959. This is a textbook Fisher game, and there's no way you can go over this game and not improve as a player yourself. Pilnick had white, Fisher had black. Let us jump right in. E4, C5, Fisher Sicilian, Knight F3, D6. And very quickly, we have the Nidorf, definitely Fisher's main opening against E4. Even to this day, Probably the best opening that black can play when they really want to win with the black pieces. Pilnick plays bishop e2. The classical system doesn't put immediate pressure on black, a more positional approach. Fisher could play e6, the Scheveningen structure, but instead he plays e5, the Boleslavsky structure. And in this structure, much of the play will revolve around this key d5 square. Both sides want to control it, and ideally, black would like to advance d65 in the center. The, pawn, the knight moves to b3. These days, the knight will go to f3 depending on the player, but a knight to b3 was almost always played at that time. Bishop to e7. You know where the piece is going. You might as well put it there. Uh, castles, castles, bishop to e3, and bishop to e6. We see Fisher continuing to build up his control over the d5 square. f3 was played by Pilnick. Queen to c7, a standard idea in the Sicilian, helps defend these pawns and control c4. Queen to e1, uh, he wants to shift this queen to f2 and help control this b6 square, those queenside dark squares. Knight b to d7 and rook to d1 was played. If he plays a4 in an attempt to restrain black from playing b5, then black could just play d5 and Fisher would liberate his position and be in good shape. So rook to d1 was played, adding to control over the d5 square. And Fisher plays b5. And now uh, rook to d2. Uh, the worry is that black will play b4 and the pawn at c2 will hang. But when white plays a move like rook to d2, uh, you can pretty be pretty confident that black has won the opening battle and is at least equal. And that is definitely the case here. Fisher can be very happy with his middle game position. He plays the move knight to b6, continuing to control this key d5 square, controlling the center of the board. Uh, if instead b4 kicking the knight, then after knight d5, knight d5, ed5, bishop to f5, we see the bishop and queen aiming at uh, the c2 pawn. After queen to f2, a5, uh, Fisher has a huge initiative on the queen side. So instead, after knight to b6, queen to f2 was played. But as Fisher says in his book, My 60 Memorable Games, white should take that knight off as soon as he possibly can. The knight can cause all kinds of trouble. And this was definitely the opportunity to take that knight. But instead, queen to f2. Now he's threatening to win the knight, of course. Uh, but rook a to b8. But again, Fisher said, I should have played knight to c4. Cannot give white a chance to take that knight. In this case, if white takes that, then pawn takes and bishop b6 hitting the queen, queen c8, knight to a5, and these pieces look aggressive, but Fisher would just kick him back. Knight to d7 hits the bishop, it retreats. Bishop to d8 hits the knight, and it needs to retreat. Uh, a move like knight to d5, after bishop a5, yes, white would win the queen, uh, but after bishop d5, rook d5, defending the knight, then Fisher would play knight to f6, hitting the rook and removing it as a defender of the knight and winning an exchange, uh, and would just be better. So, but rook a to b8 was played in the game. And now, Pilnick finally takes that knight, and it's definitely the best move in the position. Rook takes b6, knight to d5, knight d5, e d5, and bishop to d7. And we can see, though, the accumulation of small advantages. Fisher has the bishop pair. They're just sitting there on th their own second rank, but they can emerge later in the game. Also notice this very healthy pawn majority on the king side, four versus three, that can launch forward, forward with f5 and cause a lot of trouble. He also has queenside space. Uh, f4 is played, bishop to f6, c3, so if this diagonal opens up, it will blunt Fisher's bishop at f6. The rook comes back, 
fe5, bishop takes e5, knight to d4, the knight can go into c6 or f5. So g6 keeps the knight out of the f5 square. Now a3. So Fisher plays what is known as the minority attack. So he has these two pawns at a6 and b5. Tilnik has these three pawns at a3, b2, c3. What he wants to do is trade off these two pawns for two of these pawns, leaving white with one weak isolated pawn. That's the minority attack. So he plays a5, preparing the move b4 to make those exchanges. King to h1, b4. Pawn takes, pawn takes. Now rook to c2 hits the queen. The queen moves to b6. The knight jumps into c6, and it hits the rook at b8. But Fisher ignores that, and he just takes the pawn at a3. Well, what if white had taken that rook? In that case, queen f2, rook f2, now a2. The pawn is threatening to queen with check, and there's nothing on the back rank to stop it. Rook f1, designed to stop it. Rook takes knight. Rook to a1 to blockade it. But then bishop to f5. This rook does not want to go to c1, because then the rook at b2 and uh, black would be winning in that case. But if it goes to d2, then Fisher could play bishop to b1 and imprison the rook at a1. So that is why he does not take the rook at b8. Queen takes b6, rook takes b6. Now pawn takes pawn. And we see the fruit of the minority attack is this weak a3 pawn. Uh, even though it's weak, though, it could advance to the queening square. There's no other pawn to stop it, so you've got to be careful. Rook to a8, gets in front of the pawn. Knight takes bishop. And here, Pilnick takes away Fisher's two-bishop advantage. But in exchange, look at the pawn structure. He has one beautiful healthy pawn island. Pilnick has three pawn islands, a3, d5, and then these two. Fisher's pawn structure is very nice, and now this e5 pawn is passed and can be supported by the f pawn as well. Rook to c3 defending the a3 pawn laterally, rook to b2 attacking the bishop, rook to c7 counterattacks the bishop at d7, then bishop to f5. G4 is played by Pilnick. Basically, he wants to clear that f file so his rooks can connect and take on f7, Fisher plays bishop to e4 check first. Bishop to f3 blocks the check. He'd love to just exchange off those bishops and attack f7. But now bishop to d3 was played by Bobby Fisher. The idea is he's going to use this bishop, which currently attacks the rook at f1, to help this e pawn up the board to play e4, e3, and advance it to the queening square. Um, if rook to e1 to stop the pawn, then e4, and if bishop takes e4, then just rook to e8 pins the bishop to the rook. Uh, if instead the bishop retreats to g2, then just rook to d8, rook to c5, king to g7, and after f5, these two pawns would probably be too strong, the e and f pawn. Uh, but instead, d6 is played by white, rook to d8, rook to e1, Fisher takes on d6, Pilnick takes on e5, but now Fisher can activate his pieces very quickly and white is in big trouble. He plays rook to f6, attacking the bishop at f3. Rook to e3 defends the bishop. By the way, if he plays bishop g2, then rook to b1 check loses uh, the game for white after bishop f1, rook to f2, and nothing can be done to stop. Rook b1 takes f1 checkmate. Rook to e3 is played. Rook takes bishop. Rook takes rook. Now bishop to e4. The rook is pinned. Rook c f7, but then rook to f2 and he's piling up on this pinned rook on f3. He gives one spite check to Bobby Fischer, but then Fischer plays king to g7. He'll just hide on an h6, and he has won a piece. And the game, a textbook Fischer game, there's no way going over this game is not going to improve you as a player and probably just raise your rating. Thank you for joining us at Chess Dog. See you again soon. Bye.